So some updates for the region. Um, CARES input kind of got uh, postponed due to the COVID issues, but uh, transfer agencies should be putting all the cardiac arrest in the CARES data. I hope that within the next year we can do that for non-transports as well. Uh, the only way we get better is look at our numbers to see who's doing what, compare uh, ROSC rates, uh, both for EMS agencies and for hospitals. Remember, we do have a YouTube channel you can do for Con Ed. Uh, vaccines are still out there for COVID. If you haven't got it, feel free to get those. I won't make any statements about that. Um, BRIMS is still moving. In theory, we should have been out uh, of our old building back in January. Uh, we're still there, but hopefully be moving a few blocks down on 11th Street South um, here in a couple of months. IMSA rollout, there'll be some big changes to the stroke system. We're going to have a, a Zoom meeting with the state and the EMS agencies tomorrow to talk about that. Uh, that won't go into effect until next year, but we'll uh, start pushing that out so we can start the Con Ed before October. Is that feedback going out to everybody, Chief, or are we good? So it's just us. All right, good. That's okay. Millennials, you can't get anything fixed with these millennials, right? <laughs> um, educational stuff today. We're in Aniana at a Blount County 911. Come out. We got some good uh, skills labs this afternoon. June 23rd, we're in Mobile. Uh, if you haven't heard, we have two new ER fellows starting in July. These are board certified docs. They'll be doing nothing but EMS. Uh, Dr. Uh, Julie Brown and Taylor Payne, they've done some lectures for us. You should see them in the field. Residents starting in August, I'll get a senior ER resident as well. So that means we're going to have three positions besides myself in the Brems region doing EMS care, both field care and education. So I think this is a big, uh, big win for our area. State conference is going to be on. It's in November. Man, I'm getting a headache from that. That's pretty cool, isn't it? All right. So uh, I know with the uh, paramedic shortage, the issues we got going on that we're doing a lot of care with the EMT level. EMT level is no longer basic. The things these guys are doing are pretty important. If you look at the scope of practice, these guys should be able to manage airways up to uh, BIADs, IGELs, and King Airways. I mean, we expect them to run codes, do AEDs, do childbirth. I say that because uh, hopefully uh, in the next few months we're going to start doing skill labs at the EMT level only. I also would ask that as a medic or an advanced EMT, if you have EMTs working with you, make sure you take them by the hand, help them get better at their skills because we're relying more and more on the EMT. The things that EMTs are doing now are things that our medics were doing back in the early 80s, right? So we got to help these guys move along and get the experience they need. All right, so 12 leads. So the way I look at 12 leads are pretty simple. I, think is the ventricular rate too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. American Heart does a great job, in my opinion, is if it's too fast, is it wide or narrow, regular or irregular? Their algorithms, I think, is reasonable. When you think about too slow arrhythms, anything that you don't pick up in your primary exam is kind of limited to either a drug issue, such as a calcium channel blocker, a beta blocker, versus electrolytes, which would be hyperkalemia or ischemia, a big STEMI or NSTEMI heart issues. Anything else you pick up on your exam, and the scary EKGs, the ones are kind of okay-ish. These are the ones that we got to be able to pick up, the, the STEMIs, the Brugada, the Wellens, the left and right bundles. And these are all things that as medics, we should start be moving forward to do as well. When EMS first came of age, we looked at rhythms like junctional or heart blocks, so forth, and that's very important. Uh, that's before we had interventions for STEMIs. Now we have interventions. We can cath people, we can lice them. So you got to be the 12 lead masters, so. Know how to calculate a rate. I use the box method, 300, 150, 100, big boxes between the QRS complexes. If it's more than four or five, then I start kind of wandering with my thoughts. If it gets to seven or eight, I know the rate is way too slow. To determine regularity, I hand on the pulse. I'm not looking at the machine because rates greater than 180 can really mess with you and it's hard to say is it regular or irregular. So hands on the pulse gives you a lot of information. You gotta know, you gotta know your intervals. The PR interval, we all learned in medic school that a prolonged PR interval is a first three heart block. In reality, first three heart blocks really don't matter. Not a big deal. But long PR can also be indicative of hyperkalemia, which does matter and kills people. So we got to think about that. The QRS complex, very important, because if you don't know what's wide and what's narrow, you can't determine if somebody's in VTAG versus SVT. Treatment management is different. And also with the QRS complex being wide, it kind of shows you a left bundle or right bundle, which changes how you interpret a 12 lead. The QT interval is very important. You have people that are weak or syncopized and you got a prolonged QT. You start thinking, are they having dysrhythmias like torsades? 
And there are also drugs that we carry every day and probably give every day when you're at work that prolong the QT that can hurt people. What are a couple of drugs that prolong QT? Anybody know? Anybody care? Is that echo? Echo? Yeah, how on Zofran. So we use Zofran like it's candy. You really can't overdose somebody on Zofran and unless the QT is long. But I've seen folks with long QT get Zofran going to torsades, all right? Those guys get high quality CPR, defibrillation, and what drug else do we give them for torsades? Magnesium. So it's pretty cool you get to work a code, but it's not cool for that patient. So be advised, you don't have to get an EKG or 12 lead on every patient before you give Zofran, but think about it, all right? Haldol is another one that prolongs the QD. It's just Benadryl. So in the past, before we had, oh, praise God, thank you, Chief. Before we had uh, uh, ketamine, we'd use a lot of Haldol, a lot of uh, Benadryl, uh, and those psych patients that own those at baseline, we give more of that medicine, big risk for going to cardiac arrest. But ketamine, that risk has gone away, but the new risk appeared, which is what? Respiratory depression, right? But we can manage that, a lot safer. All right, so 12 leads. I look at these things. I say, is this rate too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? I say the rate is okay. So the next thing I'm going to do now is look for injury patterns, things that we need to get off scene, get to the hospital quickly. So I'm looking at leads one, AVL, and lateral, five and six. These are my lateral leads. If those look fine, the next thing I do is I move on inferiorly, two, three, and AVF. I'm looking for ST elevation or depression. After I do that, I'm looking at V1 through V4. These are our septal leads in between the uh, ventricles, and these are our anterior leads. So elevation here is very concerning for a septal anterior MI. And then obviously we got depression here, T-wave inversion with ST depression. This is a posterior MI as well, or posterior STEMI. These guys get put in the STEMI system. Um, you can be fancy, be academic, and move the leads uh, uh, V1 to V6, move them around to the backside to look at the back of the heart. But in clinically, this is a STEMI equivalent. I'm not gonna waste my time with that. I'm gonna take this patient, put them in the system, move toward the hospital, and that's a STEMI until proven otherwise. The last place I look is lead AVR. So elevation, I lead AVR and depression anywhere else, such as in one AVL or five and six, or inferiorly, and obviously anywhere through here, that's a STEMI equivalent as well. That guy needs to be put in the system, on scene, move to our interventionalist, okay? The other thing you got to think about too, so once I go through all my injury patterns, and then I go back and I'm going to look at my, my intervals. So I'm going to look at my PR interval okay. I'm going to look in lead two. That looks reasonable. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm looking at my QRS complex. I go to leads V1 and V2. Is my QRS complex wide or not? So less than 120 it looks reasonable, all right? Because if this QRS complex is wide, we could have a right bundle or a left bundle, right? So this is a left bundle. That changes everything we do. Now we have to use something like scarbosis criteria to determine if they're having a STEMI, right? So scarbosis is basically if I have Y complex QRS greater than 120, it points down a V1, kind of turns left, like you turn the turn signal, right? I got no Q wave and AVL, that's the left bundle, right? So now this elevation here that makes you a little uncomfortable is reassuring, right? You should have discordance. The QRS complex should go the opposite direction of the T wave. If that's the case, you're doing fine. What gets you is when you have concordance. So QRS complex going up and an ST segment going up. That's the STEMI equivalent. That gets put in the system. But this one, even though it looks concerning, looks scary, not super scary because I know it's a left bundle, right? I thought I had a right bundle on there, but I guess I don't. And the last thing I do before I put this EKG down as I look one more time. I'm gonna look for injury patterns again. So I've gone through, looked for injury patterns. I've looked at my intervals. I feel pretty comfortable. And there's some days I'm really tired and my monster hasn't kicked in. So I look before I put it down, I look one more time to make sure I'm not missing things. Lateral, two, three, and ABF, B1 through B4, and AVR. And this is just a schematic kind of overlaying what this means, showing that elevation in AVR means it's very proximal to where the left and right main artery come off. So elevation, AVR depression means it's gonna be a big area of infarct, bad news for the patient. Inferior is the right coronary, T3 and AVF. The circumflex is lateral. And then this is what we used to call the whittle maker, the left anterior, for the most part. Very important that we read these 12 leads because machines don't do a good job. The 
the handouts for the Zoll, the life hacks talk about they're like 93% efficient or uh, accurate. I would argue probably not. Uh, like any machine, there are issues. You look at this blood pressure. What's that blood pressure? 79 over 80. Can that be real? No, the machine thinks it's real anyway. I've seen machines say no STEMI when there's been a big freaking STEMI uh, and vice versa. So you guys should be able to read 12 leads. There's a couple of resources out there. Life in the fast lane is a good one. I know I mentioned that several times. Wave Maven is another good one. Uh, there's one on Facebook. I might be butchering it. Akadoodle or something. Have y'all seen that one? Yeah. So a lot of resources out there. Don't get all your stuff from me by any means. Get out there. Look at 12 leads. If you don't look at leads every day, you're going to miss something. If there's a month that I'm not clinically working a lot, I'm down a few shifts. Sometimes I'll sit up at night and look at EKGs to make sure I stay fresh. This is a skill just like IV starts, just like anything else. If you don't do it repetitively, you're not going to be good at it. And if you step away for a few weeks or a few months, you're going to miss it next time on shift. And you don't want to do that because people will die. Cool. So we got a 48 year old female first case uh, from Walker County. Uh, she's diaphoretic for the past hour and short of breath. Uh, so what are we going to do for this? I can't say cheek for this patient. Yeah. So we're going to get Walker County, 48 years old. That's pretty funny. I thought that I, I, I like Walker County for everybody online. Sorry. Um, so obviously we're going to begin doing a primary exam, ABCs, while we're getting our vitals, okay, and doing a, a pertinent history, okay. Remember the history questions that we ask people, the only reason we care about the history is we're going to say, are they high risk for a bad outcome today? So 48-year-old female with sweatiness, shortness of breath, what questions would we want to ask this person that would be appropriate? Anybody? Yeah, if this ever happened before. If it did, what was going on then? That gives you a lot of data. Don't get super fancy. I'm just a redneck too. So, hey, did it happened before? Have you seen a doctor for this? What's going on? Cool. What other questions are we going to ask her? How much meth have you smoked? Well, Walker County, hello. That's a joke. Man, it's a tough crowd today. Um, so, yeah, so history, any history of diabetes, right? So diabetes puts people at high risk. I say shots or pills. If you have diabetes, if you're on shots, we assume it's insulin. There are injectable drugs out there now, but we assume it's insulin and there are high risk for bad outcomes for MIs, coronary artery disease, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I ask about any recent surgeries. Have you ever had surgery? Ever had blood clot? OK, those things all take this patient and put her in a category. Do I think she's super sick or not sick? And that kind of dictates the pace at which I'm going to do things for her, right? Just like my primary exam, if I'm looking at her, she's breathing 12 times a minute. I put my hand in her pulse, her skin is warm and dry, her heart rate's in the 70s, and she's talking to me. I'm going to evaluate her, but I'm not going to be calling my partner over here really quick, and moving real fast. Versus, I put my hand in her pulse, and she's got no radial, but a very fast carotid. She's sweaty. She's breathing 40 times a minute. I'm going to move a little bit faster, right? So we're saying sick, not sick. Risk that I find determine what we're going to do. OK, I know that in the ER we see a lot of I won't say junk. That's not a right way to say it. We see a lot of non emergent medical conditions we have to manage. And that's not why I went to emergency medicine. That doesn't excite me. Now I'm going to take care of people. But what I do want to do is that person who's really ill. I want to make a difference and intervene with them. So you got to be able to reckon that stuff. Sweet. So she's sweaty. She's ill appearing. Blood pressure is 104 or 68. Heart rate or pulse rate is 98. And I say pulse rate because you always want to get your hands on the patient, feel the pulse, regular, irregular, strong, thready, whatever. Respirations are 20 ish with her with the increased work of breathing. And I may have said this numerous times in the past, but respiratory rate really, nobody counts that really well. So rates greater than 30 or 40 should make you uncomfortable. Rates less than 10 should make you uncomfortable. Everything in between is kind of reasonable, especially when you guys show up with the big red trucks and lights and sirens, right? I use kind of a rule of six. So as I'm sitting there, I'm talking to the patient, doing a quick scene survey, uh, survey of the patient, my hands on the pulse. I'm counting her respirations and I count for six seconds because I can count to six in my brain and watch somebody breathe, right? If, if they breathe one time in six seconds, how fast are they breathing in a minute? 10. Yeah, so that's reasonable. I'm comfortable with that. If they breathe four times during the time I'm counting in six seconds, how fast are they going? 40. Too fast. Yeah, so I'm doing a quick purview. Six seconds, that gives me a relative rate that matters, and then I'm looking at them. Are they sitting upright? Are they tripoding? Are they nasal flaring? Using accessory muscles? That's how to determine increased work of breathing. 
I'm not going to sit there, look at my watch for 60 seconds and count and then breathe. All right, two reasons. One, it takes too long. And two, I'm going to start thinking about going fishing or drinking a monster or something. My mind's going to race. Can't do it for a minute. Cool. So history things, hypertension, diabetes, ever had a heart attack or a stroke, okay, that puts it at a higher risk. All right, this chick says she has a history of a gastric ulcer. That makes you think potentially she could have some uh, gastric issues, some bleeding, all right? Ted is uh, tobacco, alcohol, or drug use. I try to ask people that, hey, do you, do you smoke? Yes or no. Smoking puts them at higher risk for things. Um, if she's 48 years old, let's say she's 38, and she smokes and she's on birth control pills and has chest pain, what is she super high risk for? PEs, right, so this stuff gives you information, right? Alcohol use makes you think, okay, she could have pancreatitis, she could have another gastric ulcer issues, and then the D is drug use. And I just, I come out right and ask people, hey, no offense, I ask everybody, even my mom, do you do cocaine, do you do any drugs, right? You get that information because there's certain drugs that people use that we can help them with. If they're pinging on meth and a little bit hypertensive, not a lot we can do. They just smoked a, uh, some crack and now they're having chest pain and hypertensive. We could actually give them the medicine that would help them, all right, that we carry. And what drug could we help them with their cocaine induced chest pain or anxiety? Anybody know? Not ketamine. Hmm? Benzos. Yeah, so benzos are great for cocaine induced chest pain, ischemia. Sometimes you see people with EKG changes. They're hypertensive, tachycardic, EKG is pretty jacked up. They've been smoking some crack. You give them some benzos, they chillax a little bit, that EKG will look better. Now, they're still gonna get their aspirin, the nitro, they're gonna see the cardiologist, but sometimes they, those benzos will help these people. Cool. Medications will give you a lot of information. If she says they have no health problems, but they take Coumadin, what does that tell you? On a blood thinner, they got health problems, right? So you ask the questions. A lot of times they can't give you information. They say, I take that blue pill, that hypertensive pill, whatever. Um, for guys, I usually ask before I start doing nitros or anything like that, are they on Cialis or Viagra? But you got to do it in a way they're going to answer you. If you're standing around and there's, you know, in Walmart and there's a bunch of people around and you got six guys and the guy's girlfriend, they're not going to answer that question, right? So you have to be uh, reasonable and appropriate the way you ask those things. Cool. So. We're doing EKG, so this is our EKG. Too fast, too slow, or okay? I like I'm in church, because nobody said, thank you for saying okay. Very good, I agree, the rate looks okay, yeah. It's less than, it's, it's greater than 50 and less than 150. So it's okay-ish, right? So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look injury patterns. I'm gonna look in the one, look in AVL. I'm gonna look in five and six. Then I go back, I look at two, three, and AVF. I look V1 through V4. I'm looking at AVR. I'm going to go back and look in V2. I got a P wave. That looks reasonable. My QT is less than half the R to R. And my QRS is a little bit wide, but it's not wide enough to be a left bundle or a right bundle. All right, so I've done that. And then one more time, I'm going to look injury patterns because I'm tired. It's been a long day. So what do we see here? Concerns, no concerns. Do you care? Do you read this? No, you don't read that. Not first off. You have to, at some point, if you want to put them in the STEMI system, that's the first question they ask you. But uh, I, again, I would recommend that you guys know how to read these and not trust this. So what do you think? Good, bad, indifferent? Okay, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I would say that the T-wave inversions in V2 and V3 not, uh, make me a little bit uncomfortable, right? So maybe some ST depression there, but there's really not much there, and it's not more than one millimeter. So this makes me think, hmm, something's not right, but I agree, I don't really call it a STEMI. I don't see any elevation in one, nothing in AVL. Five and six looks reasonable. Two, three in AVF look reasonable. This makes me uncomfortable. It's not a posterior, but it makes me uncomfortable. And then AVR looks reasonable. So I would say, if you say normal versus abnormal, I say it's abnormal. Is it a STEMI or not a STEMI? It's not a STEMI, but does it make you concerned? I say, yeah, I got a 48-year-old female who's got diabetes and hypertension, and now uh, diaphoretic, short of breath with abnormal EKG. So still concerning, not a STEMI, but concerning. So what are we gonna do for this uh, patient? So we got all these cool protocols out there, which uh, 
they're kind of like guidelines. Um, years ago when I was working EMS, we had a statement at the, at the very back of the protocol book and it said, if uh, unsure what to do and cannot reach med control, do the right thing. That was the paraphrase. So that's, that's pretty cool, right? So that's, that means you have an active medical director that understands things can get jacked up sometimes, but different story. So we got uh, chest pain or suspected ACS. She has no real chest pain, but I'll be concerned for acute coronary syndrome because she's female diabetic, mature with abnormal EKG. So we talk about this a lot in these classes. We got Mona and Fona, right? So what's the most important drug for her at this point in the game, you think? Aspirin, right? So aspirin is going to make those platelets not bond together. She's having a big infarct. It's going to be good for her. However, she mentioned to us that she has a history of gastric ulcers, and she also was a drinker by our TED exam that we did. So what other questions will we ask her before we give her an aspirin at this point in the game? Yeah, yeah. So now it kind of changes. If she was having a big STEMI, doesn't matter. She gets an aspirin. She's not having a STEMI, but she's concerned. We're concerned about her. So now I'm asking more questions, and that's going to risk stratify. Do I give her aspirin or not? So hey, you've been vomiting blood. You've been crapping blood. You know, make it simple language. Don't say, do you have any hematoemesis? I can't even spell that word, right? So use regular language and ask them. If she said, yeah, I got my, some black stools. I've been vomiting a lot of blood. I would probably hold aspirin on this girl at this point in the game, right? Because risk to benefit, we can make her bleed more, and she's not having a STEMI yet. That doesn't mean she's not having a heart attack, but it means we don't have enough data to give her the aspirin at this point in the game. Does that make sense? Cool. So aspirin is very important in cardiac stuff. We talked about aspirin. What other drugs can we give her if we think about Mona? There's aspirin. What else can we do? Nitro. Her blood pressure was a little bit soft, I think, wasn't it? Let's go back. Yeah, 104 over 68, not really having chest pain. Would you give her nitro? I probably would not give her nitro either. I agree. Not at this point, okay? There's a risk to dropping her blood pressure. If she is throwing up blood, having a gastric ulcer, and that's why she feels bad, and I give her a nitro, she's going to be volume down, I'm definitely going to drop her blood pressure, right? Um, if I were to consider it for this lady, if my gestalt was more of heart attack than GI stuff, I'd make sure I have IV access, and I'm giving her a bolus before I even do that, right? It's poor form to take somebody from a blood pressure of 100 to a blood pressure of 60, right? You need to drive faster, right? And the lights go on, but it's not good for the patient. Cool. What about oxygen? Does she need oxygen? Yes, no, or maybe? Yeah, so I, I kind of agree with that, yeah. Um, she was breathing a little bit fast, 20-ish, okay? And I think that her complaint was shortness of breath too, right? So I would say that she is symptomatic. She may not be hypoxic, but she's breathing fast and says she's short of breath. So I think oxygen is reasonable for this lady as well. And then what about uh, morphine? Morphine good for her? Yeah, she's not hurting. So I want to give her morphine either. And it's also going to drop her blood pressure. Very good. You know, Fona is the same thing. Is it change out fentanyl for morphine? Uh, fentanyl doesn't drop your blood pressure. It's a newer narcotic. It can be useful if she was hypotensive and having pain. She's really not having pain. So I think her, she gets IV access. She gets a fluid bolus. Okay. And we keep moving with that. And this is an inappropriate joke. What else does she get? What is that guy? Yes. What is he, though? Don't use profanity. I'll get in trouble. He's a serial killer, right? So we get serial EKGs. Yeah, okay. Sorry. It was a long night. I thought it was funny. So serial EKGs as well. So I got this 48-year-old chick with nausea, vomiting, shortness of breath. EKG is abnormal, but not a STEMI. So as I manage her, I start moving toward the hospital. I'm giving her some fluids. I reassess. I'm cycling the blood pressures. And every now and then, I just hit print on that EKG, and I look. And if it comes up later that she starts having elevation somewhere, and now she's a STEMI, even better. Now you call TCC. Hey, I got a 48-year-old female showing STEMI in the monitor. I'm going to go to X hospital. Are they available for a cath app? Very simple, right? Thank you for almost smiling. Good, 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 good. good. All right, second case. This is a 77-year-old male, uh, complaints of weakness and syncope. He says uh, that he tried to walk from his bedroom to the bathroom, and he just kind of fell over and fell out. He got up, crawled back in the bed, and did it again. And this has been going on for about, I don't know, 12 hours or so. What are we going to do for that guy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so just like last time, right, we're going to do uh, ABCs by getting pertinent histories. He's a 77-year-old fellow. Past medical history may be pertinent, but at 77, you assume they have every known disease known to man, right? Right. 
even if they don't know of it, they probably got it. So ABCs, he's alert, he's talking to you, heart rate's in the 70s, good blood pressure, he's 90 over 60, breathing about 12 times a minute, all right? So questions I would ask this guy, obviously past medical, um, if he says no, he's still got stuff, but what's the real important question you wanna ask an old dude that falls as far as drugs, what drugs? Blood thinners, yeah. Everybody in America's on a blood thinner. They expect that rate to go up even higher. Uh, so blood thinners, that puts them at high risk for things. Cool. So he's a little bit confused with me. He's alert. Blood pressure is soft at 98 over 60. That's real soft for Alabama. Heart rate, our pulse rate is 82. He's breathing 14 times a minute. He's setting about 97%. And then anybody that started IV on, I'd recommend you get a D-stick. Gives you a lot of data or AccuCheck or glucose, whatever you call it. Um, if it reads low, you can fix it. If it reads high, you know what the problem is. Uh, anything in between is pretty reasonable. Most people that I see in the ER are unhealthy and you'll see glucose is two, three, 400. Not super concerning uh, for the most part. So low is important, high is important. A 126 just tells me he's probably a diabetic, right? Or he just had a <laughs> honey bun with icing on it from a gas station in Aniana. That's what I did this morning, but don't tell anybody. All right, so this is the EKG. Too fast, too slow, or okay? I hear mumbling, somebody said okay. Yeah, I say it's okay-ish, yeah. So I did box method, I find a QRS is on a box so that one so 300 150 175 so 70 to 80 ish right not super concerning i'm gonna look injury patterns i'm gonna look at leads one avl and five and six i'm gonna look at two three and avf i look v1 through v4 and i look at avr then i go back and i'm looking at my pr intervals now nah, there's maybe a p wave somewhere that might be it if it is that's freaking long isn't it all right, so um, I look in V1 for P waves. Maybe that's it there. I don't know. QRS is reasonable. Okay, my QT seems maybe a little bit long. It's almost half the distance of the R to R, but not super scary, not greater than half that distance. And then before I put this thing back down, I'm going to look at lead one, AVL, five and six, inferiorly, and AVR. So, what do y'all think about this EKG? Normal, abnormal, abnormal. STEMI, no STEMI is the next question. No STEMI. Yeah, I like that. Good eyesight from the person with good eyes. Yeah, yeah. I would say his history is he's been passing out, but he denied chest pain or shortness of breath. He's a little bit confused, fella, but no, no, uh, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no nausea, vomiting, not diaphoretic. Just every time he gets up and walks, he passes out. I would argue, yes, that we are up a little bit in lead three. Very subtle, but I say it's a millimeter. And then this morphology and elevation also makes me uncomfortable, right? Yeah, maybe some reciprocal changes in AVL. And V6 is a hair, yeah. So when you think about looking at injury patterns, so if I had this one's okay, this one's okay, this one, yeah, maybe half a millimeter. And this one's one that really is still not a STEMI equivalent. You've got to have two leads in the same pattern that are elevated. So two leads between one AVL and five and six, or two leads between two, three, and AVF, or two between V1 through V4, or up in AVR and down in some kind of pattern, either laterally or inferiorly, right? So I would argue this dude's got an ST elevation. He's got a STEMI. Kind of weird, though. He's 77, doesn't have chest pain, not short of breath. He says, every time I stand up and walk, though, I just fall over. I pass out. He's not tripping, right? He's not tripping. <laughs> he actually is tripping. So, um, so, yeah, very concerning EKG. So what do you do with this guy? Does he go in the system? Does he not go in the system? Yeah, I would say I'd argue that syncope in an old dude, okay, but this EKG goes in the system. Now, this person probably needs to have a discussion between the ER doc and cardiologist and the patient to figure out what's going on. But let's say he has dementia. 
now he gets to the hospital. You don't put him in a system. And he says, yeah, my chest has been hurting since, you know, 1982. I'm short of breath. Now everything changes. And everybody kind of looks at you like, no, his EKG is a STEMI, right? So risk to benefit, this guy needs to be discussed with the ER doc and cardiologist. So I'll put him in the system as well. I'll call TCC. Now, the machine doesn't say STEMI. It says sinus bradycardia, prolonged PR, undetermined rhythm. What do you do? How do you put him in the system there? What do you do? Transmit it. Yeah, you transmit it. You call TCC. Hey, I got a patient with a STEMI equivalent. You can sound pretty cool. Got a STEMI equivalent patient. Machine does not read 12 lead. They're going to ask you that. But I would like to know if X hospital is available for a cath lab. And if so, can I speak to them about putting this patient in the system? This EKG goes to that hospital. That ER doctor will look at it and say yay or nay. If they say yay, you go there, you smile, you're in the STEMI system. If they say nay, you still go to that same cath lab hospital, but you're not in the system. So if you put somebody in the STEMI system that does not say STEMI on top, but you're concerned, the ER that you call says no, you still go to that hospital. Because if you're concerned enough to put them in the system, there's something going on, right? So maybe that doc is busy or tired. Maybe that doc has a bad photocopy of this, uh, whatever. If you go to a non cath lab hospital with this patient and he is having a STEMI, what happens? Yeah, well, and more importantly, he has to then be transferred to another hospital and there are risks to that, okay? So will you miss some of these? Will you over triage some of these? You probably will, and that's okay because you'll learn from each one of them and you'll get better, okay? I'd rather you under triage, under triage, over triage than under triage. Thank you, it's time for another drink, my monster. Yes, sir. Oh. Hey, use your, use your mic. So if you're getting serial EKGs, send them all to us for review. Um, we've had a couple cases here recently where uh, the medic was concerned about a patient, had a good story, sent one EKG, is very equivocal EKG. If they show up in the ED, they're like, hey, this is the one I got, this one I sent you, this one I got five minutes later while I'm en route, and the second one is an obvious STEMI, okay? So if you're getting serial EKGs and you have concern about the patient, Go ahead and transmit all of those EKGs to us because it may not be evident on the first one. You may get a lot of noise artifact bumping down the road or et cetera. Just for whatever reason, if you have multiple EKGs, go ahead and send them all to us for review. Okay? Yes, I agree. If you're concerned, let us know. So our job, my job as the regional director is to help you out. I'm on your team, believe it or not. OK, so if you're concerned about the patient, you put them in the system, you're taking care of them. We're going to help you, okay? Now, if you send every patient that has a 12 lead done and you put them in a the system, regardless of what the machine says or the situation is, then we're going to have to have a talk, right? You can't do that, okay? But if you're looking at the EKG, you're interpreting it, and you see something concerning, you're concerned for the patient's safety, put them in the system. And then we can always review those as well. Again, you get better by looking at a lot of these things, by making a decision, and then getting feedback. And if you need more feedback, I can help with that too. And I mean nice feedback, not bad feedback. Sweet. All right, so I would say this is a STEMI equivalent or STEMI on this patient. All right. So what are we gonna do for him? Blood pressure is a little bit soft, probably does not need nitro at this point in the game, right? He's also having an inferior infarct. So hypotensive with an inferior infarct, I'm probably not gonna give him nitro. I'm gonna start IV fluids for him. Does he get an aspirin? I'd say, yeah, yeah, his EKG is pretty jacked up. I'd give him an aspirin. There's a risk to that, but he gets an aspirin, okay? The other concerns I have for this guy would be that 77-year-old fella having uh, a big STEMI on EKG, or a STEMI uh, on EKG, though he's fallen, right? So the older we get in life, our brain slowly kind of atrophies, right? So people who are older, people with dementia, their brain atrophies. People who are malnourished and alcoholics, their brain atrophies. As the brain shrinks, it puts pressure on the vessels that run through the subdura to the, to the skull. So little falls for these guys make them really high risk for head bleeds, okay? So having uh, syncope and a STEMI, aspirin is reasonable, right? But when he gets to me, I gotta do a few more things to figure out what's going on uh, before I start giving other medications. So STEMI's in the hospital, in addition to the aspirin, we give them other drugs that jack up platelets. So this is just a, little, a uh, video of how platelets 
They start attaching to each other anytime there's an injury to a vessel. So if there was a plaque rupture that caused this STEMI, the plaque is moved, plate that start adhering to this, try to fix it, but it makes the clot worse, right? Same thing here. Plaque ruptures, plate that's come along, they start trying to do it. I give aspirin and make sure these platelets don't stick together good. But in the hospital, once we recognize that STEMI, we give other drugs that work on platelets too. We give uh, TICAG or Plavix, and they work on different receptors than the aspirin. So my job in the hospital is to make these platelets not work at all. So that continues to flow. But like I said, the risk for this dude is he could have fallen and have blood in the brain. And now if I give him those extra medicines, I've really made him worse. OK, now when we go in and the cardiologist puts a catheter in, they open up this clot. They usually put a stent. And that stent attracts platelets, so we have to really anticoagulate them for a while so that stent doesn't clot off. And they have another big heart attack. If he's got blood in his brain, I can't anticoagulate him. We can still go in with a catheter, balloon this open. All right. And buy some time. Hope it doesn't reocclude until this gets better and we can go back in a few weeks later and put a stent in. There's something we got to think about in the hospital. So this guy showed up to me <clears throat> and uh, before I did anything else besides the aspirin because I get a quick head CT. All right. I'm also talking to cardiologists and there's also some differences in cardiology uh, opinions. Um, I, I talked to two different cardiologists about this guy and the short version is he went to the cath lab. Uh, but some people still have difficulty recognizing the fact that syncope can be a symptom of acute myocardial infarction as well. I better be quiet. Next slide. So this is a, uh, I've shown this a few times. This was sent to me by uh, some of the works in the cath lab. And you can see how the EKG changes. So we got STEMI. Now the balloons up and the ST changes go away. They adjust the wire balloon up again, getting ready to put the stent in. So you can see dynamic changes there. It's pretty cool. I wish we had the pictures from the, uh, the, uh, the fluoro as well. Other thing on this dude is I would say that we already seeing some Q waves here. So that tells me this may have been going on for a little bit longer than a day. So this is somebody I definitely want to give a thrombolytic to uh, until after I get that CT and talk to a cardiologist. But cool. Oh, good catch. This is his cath. So it was the right coronary. You can see it goes through and you can see there's a big blockage right there. A little bit of distal flow, but not much. They put a couple of stents in and now look at that. Very good. So what's this guy having up with an inferior infarct? What is he at risk for during his STEMI? What things, what bad things could happen to him? You can't say death. That's like, that's like three steps down, death. So remember, inferior STEMIs, you think about heart failure, heart block. He already had a way prolonged PR, normally not scary, but a prolonged PR in somebody that syncopizes and having an inferior MI makes me think that he probably, when he gets up and he starts walking, he's having a big heart block, complete heart block or a high grade second degree. So obviously he gets pacing pads on, he gets IV access. My mind is thinking, what am I going to do if his heart rate goes to 30? What am I going to do if he passes out? Okay. And then all STEMIs are high risk for going into uh, VTAG, VFib. All right, EKG patient says they're having shortness of breath, too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. I would say it's okay-ish. It's in the 50s, but not less than 50. I'm looking injury patterns. I got some T-wave inversions. He went through V4. AVR is down. Okay, not up. I'm looking at my intervals, good PRS, uh, PR interval. QRS is a little bit wide. It points down, so I'm thinking left bundle, but I come over here and I got a Q wave. So kind of weird, not a left bundle because there's a big freaking Q wave there, all right? So what's going on with this patient? This is a trick question, just kind of a bonus, so to speak. Anybody know? The other day and I didn't know exactly anything. it's weird so I would say when you start looking another tip when sir yeah so yeah what meds are you in a beta blocker calcium channel blocker obviously they probably have heart disease right so 
On this one, normally when I look at an EKG, we talk about the way I look at these things. Another tip that kind of gets you out of trouble, lead one and lead AVR should always be opposite. So if one points down, AVR should point up, okay? If you got your leads on correctly. So I'll look at this, it looks like a left bundle, but something ain't right. I go back, look at the leads, put them on correctly, and this is the same patient, EKG done a few minutes later. So another quick tip, leads one and AVR should usually be opposite. Now I can look injury patterns and I recognize that left bundle, no Q wave. Now I can use Scarbosa, I can use some more data. So just another tip, one and AVR should always be opposite. Cool. This was a 64 year old male with abdominal pain. And what do you do? Duh, like we talked about a lot of times, we're gonna get a 12 lead. Too fast, too slow, or okay. Okay, rate is okay-ish, right, right. Now I'll do general appearance, normal, abnormal, say it's abnormal, and I start looking injury patterns. And what do y'all see? STEMI, no STEMI. STEMI, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this says sinus rhythm, anterior lateral infarction of an indeterminate age. So it's not gonna have that star, 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 STEMI on your 12 lead. So you need to be able to recognize that this is the age of the infarct is now and when this is going on. So that's a big STEMI as well. So um, we talked about oxygen earlier. American Heart says if they're not hypoxic, they don't have shortness of breath, you don't need O2. And I agree, you don't need supplemental, uh, but I still give free oxygenation to all my STEMI patients. They're a big risk going to cardiogenic shock, VTAC or VFib. And I think a little nasal cannula is reasonable. So that if they go into cardiac arrest with you guys, all you gotta do is crank the O2 up and you get passive oxygenation. There's pretty good data that hypoxia kills people. There's fair data that hyper oxygenation long-term is bad for people. So I think in the world that you practice, in the world that I practice in, STEMI patients, sick patients, get pre-oxygenation before they go into cardiac arrest. Other things you always wanna ask people having STEMIs is do this thrombolytic checklist. It's in the protocol book. I know everybody reads it, has a copy in your wallet. Um, in reality, I don't, I can't say that. It, make sure you ask the questions and get this information. So that way, if you get to the hospital and the patient goes into cardiac arrest and I cannot get that information from them, I get it from you and I can make a decision, do I give them a thrombolytic or do not give them a thrombolytic? Right, so that patient that was having the nausea vomiting with the gastric bleed, if she had a big STEMI went into cardiac arrest, when you get to me, if you don't tell me she had a gastric ulcer, I can't make a decision about, am I gonna lice her and risk bleeding or not? Okay, right. probably still would. And this is just a catheter port for that high lateral. Pretty impressive stuff they can do now. Cool, questions, comments, statements within reason so far? Right. My computer died last night, so I had to change up a few things. I couldn't load up some new EKGs. So this is not an EKG, just so you know, okay? Uh, this is a dude minding his own business at a bar and somebody hit him across the face with a beer bottle. And those things really don't break that easy like on TV. You ever tried it with your buddies? <laughs> they don't like it. Um, so guys got blurry vision and a headache. So is that normal eye or abnormal eye? Abnormal eye, anybody know what that is? Don't use profanity. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it's an open globe. That's an eye emergency. Dude's going to lose vision in that eye if we don't fix that quickly, right? So how do you manage an open globe? What do you do for this guy? All right. Cover both eyes. Yeah. Don't poke it and say, does this hurt? Right. And then cover both eyes. If you cover just one eye, the other eye's going to be looking around, tripping, and that eye's going to be moving. So cover both eyes control his pain, chillax him a little bit, and get moving toward the hospital. If it's trauma, it probably needs to go to a regular hospital that has ophthalmology. Opto's not gonna take that at Callahan because he got hit with a bottle. They may want other imaging and so forth, uh, but he definitely needs to see an eye doc pretty quick. So the eyeball is basically two balls. <laughs> You've got the uh, posterior chamber, and it's been a long day. It's full of goo, right, in the anterior chamber. So what happened here is that glass cut that cornea, 
and now you have the insides going outside. So we got to decrease the pressure in this eye. So if he's vomiting, he gets Zofran. If he's hurting, he gets pain medications. Uh, what pain medication would you not give him though? Favorite pain medication? Yeah, bad answer, but yes, you're right. Yeah. Uh, this is when you would not use ketamine. It's going to increase intraocular pressure and make the insides come out. Not very good. So cover the eye, control the pain. You can be cool and classify these by zones of injury. A zone one open globe is over the visual axis, the pupil. A zone two is in the white part, the sclera. A zone three is way back in the back, and that's usually deep penetrating GSW stab wounds, foreign bodies. Um, that obviously has to go to a trauma center to see a neurosurgeon. What is that? Yeah, there's blood in that anterior chamber, so that's a high FEMA. I know we learned about that in medic school. You don't see them a lot pre-hospital or even early on in the ER, especially years ago when everybody was on a backboard for four hours. This would layer out, so you wouldn't see it. Uh, but that is the problem. Here's this high FEMA blood in the anterior chamber. The blood supply to the eyeball was limited. Most of it's laterally on the exterior or periphery. All right. The problem is we have a lot of people on blood thinners now. They get blunt force trauma to the eye airbags or their buddy beer bottle didn't break. It just hit their eye. You can get that. So this high FEMA is a lot worse. Look, you got thick blood there at the bottom. You got a lot of blood there. You can't even see the pupil anymore. Um, most folks do pretty good with this. The way we treat this in the hospitals, we give them eye drops so that people won't dilate and constrict and tear that uh, uh, iris. What is this pupil? So this pupil is unreactive. It's pretty big. The cornea looks kind of cloudy. All right, but they're neurologically intact. They can move their arms and legs. They can talk to you. They say, my eye hurts, I got a headache, and I'm vomiting. What is this? Anybody know? A zombie. A zombie. No, sir. <laughs> no, no. Zombies don't talk, dude. Come on. Yeah. What is this? Anybody know? There's your hint right there. Yeah, glaucoma. There you go. I like it. Yeah. So this uh, acute angle glaucoma, right? So this is not the glaucoma that the older folks get. This is acute angle glaucoma, right? So basically what happens is you got fluid that's made in the back part of the eye that travels to the anterior chamber. And in theory, usually goes to this canal here. But for some reason, the pupil is now constricted. So that angle gets very narrow and that fluid can't come out. So fluid keeps coming in, can't go out, and it pushes back on the lens, the retina, their artery, and they can lose vision, okay? So people with headaches, people with nausea vomiting, do a quick peek at the eyes. I've probably seen three or four in the past 10 year, test past 10 years. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times I see them the second time they come to me, right? So that's not good. So take a quick peek at the eyes. If that pupil was unreactive, you're doing a quick neuro exam. If neuro exam is intact, you gotta think acute angle glaucoma on these folks. So we give these guys uh, drops in the eye to decrease the fluid. We also give them diuretics, which in theory will get this fluid out. In reality, it doesn't work that well because there's not much of a vascular supply there. And then we send them to the eye doctor. And what they do is they put a laser and drain the fluid out, or they can put a needle in the eye and drain it out. Yeah, that makes me uncomfortable too. I would probably vomit. This is a kid punched in the face. He's now looking up. So this right eye looks up, this eye does not move. That should be concerning, right? This is called entrapment. So this dude got punched in the face. And even though the facial bones are pretty strong, the bones in the back of the eye are pretty brittle. And so he had a lot of pressure on the eye, broke some of these bones. Those bones are attached to muscles. That muscle gets entrapped in that broken bone and he can't move his eye. So that's the sign that we know we have facial fractures. We need to evaluate that. And he's going to have to have a surgery at some point to fix that, or he's going to look funny the rest of his life. Just more pictures that kind of show. So a quick peek at the eyes gives you a lot of data. We know that we look at eyes and people are unresponsive. Do we give them Narcan, not give them Narcan? We look at the pupils and stroke victims. But anybody with a headache, nausea, vomiting, facial issues, do a quick peek. Look at the eyes. Does it work? Does it not work? You don't have to pull your pen light out. But just, you know, look at the eyes. 
gesture, you can poke them, they'll blink, they'll move that eye, okay? And it gives you a lot of data. The uh, Callahan did a eye conference for EMS several years ago, and they came up with an act jello mnemonic, and this is the kind of way they look at eye injuries and how you guys can determine do you go to Callahan or not go to Callahan. So it's assess, categorize, and triage. So you assess the eye, determine is it just medical ocular, no other issue, go to Callahan. If not, go to the ER, right? The jello mnemonic is gross external examination for eye integrity. That means look at the eye. The light palpitation for orbital pressure, uh, ocular vital signs or visual acuity, intraocular pressure, pupil reactivity, eye movement, and then confrontational bills. In reality, I don't touch eyeballs because if there is a globe injury and I touch it, I can make it worse. Plus it kind of creeps me out. Um, ocular vital signs, visual acuity is great. And that doesn't mean you pull out an eye chart and have your patients read it. You just say, hey man, can you read my badge? Do you see my fingers? You know, shoot, shoot, shoot the bird if you have to. How many fingers do you see? Does that work? Intraocular pressure. Um, I used to not do that a lot in the ER. I'm doing it more and more now. There are better devices out there, but for you guys, you want to be doing pressure while the pupil's reactive. And then also very important is can they look all directions? Okay, and that'll give you a lot of information. Is that normal or abnormal? Does he go to Callahan or to a trauma center? Yeah, right. Eyeball's probably lost. So it's already out. That pupil looks fixed. There's a big high femur. I'd be really concerned about intracranial issues for this guy. So it's going to be pain control, emesis control. If there are airway issues, you manage that. Okay, and we'll try to salvage his eye if we can, but we've got to make sure he doesn't die from his head injury. This is another open globe. It's not near as uh, obvious as that last one, but the pupil is irregular. And the guy has visual complaints, and there was a thorn that got his eye right there. You can kind of see it leaking out. So same treatment, though. Cover both eyes, control his pain, control his nausea. And I would still go to a probably trauma center for this guy and the opto can come see him. That one makes me uncomfortable, right? But you can see there's a little bit of hyphema there. That is an ocular emergency. So you got uh, hemorrhagic chemosis, just all blood in that sclera. There's blood in the anterior chamber. This is really tight. This guy needs a canthotomy. He needs somebody to come and make an incision right here to release pressure in the eye, or that eye is gonna die. Um, obviously the eye's probably jacked up, but if there's hope to salvage it, that's gotta be done now or five minutes ago. Other issues with this guy will be are there some kind of intracranial pathology. If he's on blood thinners, we need to fix those blood thinners, reverse those pretty quick too, or he can have a bad outcome. Semi-inappropriate humor. This is another one that probably needs a uh, canthotomy. This older person, anticoagulated vision. They can't see out of that eye. Really no range of motion with the eye. They're just not as chunky as that last patient. So you don't see it as tense, but they need a canthotomy and evaluate for intracranial pathology. This is a young guy that's uh, pupil, right pupil is fixed. He's got double vision and pupil is unreactive. And when you try to make him kind of follow your finger, Real quick, he can't look up, he can't look laterally, he can only look down and out. Anybody know what this is? This is a cranial nerve three issue. So people who have long-standing diabetes, hypertension can get this. But in reality, the people that get this and don't have headaches or stroke-like symptoms, this is an intracranial aneurysm until proven otherwise. So a fixed pupil, they can't talk to you, they're not moving one side of the body, what is it? is a stroke, right? A fixed pupil, headaches, nausea, vomiting, and their neuro intact is probably acute angle glaucoma, right? A fixed pupil that won't move and their neuro intact is an intracranial aneurysm to prove it otherwise. So looking at the eyes will give you a lot of information, help you determine where they should go. So you get a big aneurysm in the posterior part of the brain. It puts pressure on cranial nerve three so this guy cannot move that eye. A lot of syndromes we won't go through that. Questions, comments, statements within reason. So remember the work you do is very important. Um, 
we see a lot of not emergent stuff in the ER and in the field. Uh, but if you get complacent and you don't do a quick exam, you don't know what you're doing, you're going to miss the chance to help somebody out. And it could be your family or my family. So uh, just make sure you're training right, guys, and do the right thing. Questions within reason? Anybody awake? Maybe, maybe not. All right, let's take five minutes, then Dr. White to get started. Thank you for smiling. <clears throat> Uh, we'll get started. Go ahead, Dr. White. Hey, good morning, everybody. How are y'all? Appreciate you guys having us out here. It's good to be back. It's been a while since I've given a talk and chat a little bit today about some capnography, and then we'll go on to heart failure. Okay. So these are going to be the references uh, that were used for this. I would tell you if you're interested in learning more about this, this is probably one of the best references I've ever seen as far as learning about capnography. Almost everything else that I read through and putting together this lecture, all of their references reference this. Okay, so excellent resource if you want to learn a little bit more. So just a little bit of intro. I was introduced by a German bioengineer, Carl Luft, in 1943, with the goal to prevent hypoxia by using an indirect method of measure. And I clearly see the advances that have been made from early on to now these little handheld devices we just throw on the end of the tube uh, for a quick little readout. So why are we going to use it? It's going to help in the differential diagnosis of hypoxia. Okay, it's going to help you with the early detection and intervention before hypoxia occurs. It directly reflects CO2 elimination by the lungs. It's going to indirectly ref reflect production by tissues and the circulatory system and circulatory support with transport back to the lungs. Okay. It's going to give you a little bit of information about CO2 production, pulmonary perfusion, your alveolar ventilation, and help you kind of get a gauge on what respiratory patterns you might be seeing in your patient. Go over some brief terminology here. All right, normal end title should be about 38, but 35 to 45, pretty acceptable, all right? Indi uh, includes four phases. Phase one is going to be the inspiratory baseline. It essentially reflects the inspired gas that the patient has inhaled. It should be devoid of carbon dioxide. We'll go over why here in a little bit. Does anybody know why that should be devoid of carbon dioxide? What's the composition of air? Not much carbon dioxide. <laughs> Very good. Right. <laughs> uh, phase two, okay, it's going to be this upstroke that you've got. That's the expiratory upstroke. This is going to be a transition between what we call the anatomic dead space and the gas that has been exchanged within the alveoli as it starts to build up. Okay, the anatomic dead space is essentially the air that you breathe in that does not participate in gas exchange in the alveoli which is going to be the majority of what you inhale and exhale. All right, then you've got the alpha angle. It's going to be the transition from phase two to phase three and then on into phase three here. It's going to be your plateau. This is traditionally the partial pressure of CO2 at the end of the expiration. This is essentially the gas that's being sampled from the alveoli, right? Beta angle is going to be that transition from phase three back to phase one, right? And phase, uh, sorry, and then zero is going to be the inspiratory downstroke. That's the beginning of the next inspiration, okay? So we've got inspired air. We begin exhalation. We're at the end of our exhalation, and we're transitioning into our next inspiration. There is a phase four that you might see this little kind of upstroke right at the end of three that can be seen in pregnant patients. So a little bit about the physiology, okay? This is what we we're just referencing, all right? So the composition of air is about 78% nitrogen, about 20.9% of what we round up to 21% oxygen, about 0.03% carbon dioxide, and then others. And this is why we say, on inspiration, it should be relatively free of carbon dioxide, okay? 
I say, I'm just kind of reiterating the same statement. So what's going to happen in the alveoli after you've taken that breath is you're going to have diffusion gradients, right? This is how we get O2 in and CO2 out. A little bit smaller than a woman. So these are the alveoli. This is what's participating in gas exchange. You've taken a breath in. It's coming down your airways. It hits these small cells here. You've got 21% oxygen here. Okay, they're breathing room air. We have oxygen, relatively oxygen O2 devoid blood coming back from the venous system, okay, back to the right heart and then to the lungs. So the oxygen is going to diffuse down its gradient into the capillaries and come back to the left side of the heart, all right. But what is coming back is blood that is relatively high in CO2, all right. And so now we have this area that is relatively low in CO2, blood that's high in CO2, so it's going to diffuse in back out into the alveoli. And this is what gets expired. Okay, so this is what we're picking up, what we're trying to detect. Now, the actual concentration is going to be determined by ventilation and perfusion. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in different pathologies. But when we talk about ventilation, maybe an asthma, emphysema, COPD patient, right? They may not be able to ventilate down to the alveoli. Somebody may have a perfusion problem. Maybe they've got a big PE. There's no blood flow coming back. Okay. Any area in which you have higher ventilation without a matched perfusion, you're going to have lower CO2 concentrations, right? So you can bring all the air in that you want that is devoid of that CO2, but if there's no blood coming back through that capillary past that alveoli, there's no gradient for that CO2 to diffuse down. So we've talked a little bit about already that respiratory dead space. Okay, it's that CO2 free area that do not participate in gas exchange, essentially anything proximal to the alveoli, your larger airways. Okay. Exhalation. Essentially at the beginning of exhalation, this is why there's no CO2 detected, why you have that expiratory upstroke in your waveform is because that dead space has not participated in that gas exchange. There's no CO2 to detect yet, right? So we've got to get all that gas down from the alveoli back up to the mouth for us to detect it. So it's going to gr uh, rise gradually, all right? Went over that, all right, to the peak. So at the end of exhalation and the beginning of the CO2 free gas inhalation, this is where that level drops off from phase three back to zero going into one, okay? So this cycle is essentially what's gonna give you that waveform. Y'all think of some uses why we might use end tidal? Confirm intubation. Okay, <laughs> one. Any other reason? Okay, so endotracheal tube placement, all right? Cardiac arrest, we can monitor compressions and we can look for what? ROSC, okay. Sedating medications, if you administer some ketamine and you now have altered your patient, I would highly suggest you put in title on them. Dr. Ferguson would like for you to as well. Yes. <laughs> and there's a multitude of other reasons that we may use it for, okay. Um, within critical illness, trauma, sepsis, DKA, pulmonary pathology, fluid responsiveness. I like to use it on my DKA patients, right? We can save a lot of blood draws off of our patients just looking for that pH, all right? Because I can get a gauge on what's going on just by watching their end tidal, all right? Your COPD or with their CO2 retention, right? We can get a real good idea of what's going on with them. Are we making them better? Are we making them worse? So let's talk a little bit more specifically about endotracheal intubation. All right, so what are some factors that might suggest you have a correct tube placement but are not necessarily confirmatory? Lung sounds, chest rise, fogging of the tube, what else? Okay, so equal breath sounds, chest wall movement, no sounds over the stomach, fogging of the tube, you can palpate the cuff, you felt it go through, or your partner, hopefully not you, 
be relatively impressive, I guess you could. Um, improvement of patient vitals and your colometric cap. Problem with these colometric caps is you can actually get false positives. Okay, they've put down that case of beer right before you intubated them, right? or if they've vomited gastric contents up into right as you were starting to get that tube in and go to put your cap on, those acidic gastric contents can give you a color change. Okay, a normal end tidal waveform and or digital readout confirms, and I put confirm in quotation marks there. It doesn't truly confirm. It is just another adjunct to help you, but it is better than all of these for sure. Okay, and we'll go over why it doesn't truly confirm some of the false positives that you can even get on your end tidal. All right. But it's also an excellent way to continue to monitor for tube displacement during transport and transition from stretcher to stretcher, okay, or from floor to stretcher or what have you. So some considerations here. You may not be able to detect end tidal in low cardiac output states. Okay, these can be profound shock, cardiac arrest, or just really bad chest compression. Some false positives, we already talked a little bit about carbonated beverages. If the patient, for whatever reason, has been receiving mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR, why is that now? Do what? So everybody wants to give an answer, but nobody's real confident. <laughs> right, because it's the exhaled CO2 from the person giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth that may be filling up their belly, filling up their lungs, all right? So it's no longer the CO2 devoid air that's being pushed into their lungs, in theory, okay? Esophageal intubation, you may initially be able to detect some CO2, all right? But in theory, this should rapidly fall off and decline within about three to six breaths. Might give you a waveform that looks a little something like this, okay? So you've got these nice waveforms. Hey, we're all high-fiving, got the tube in. And somebody looks over and went, hey, wait, what, what's happened here? Actually, that might be goosed, okay? How about some false negatives, okay? Failure to detect CO2 despite the fact that you got the tube through the cords, all right? So again, cardiac arrest, no flow state. If there's no blood coming past the alveoli and no gas exchange occurring, you're not going to detect anything. This can result or, from a massive PE, Again, contamination of your detector with gastric contents, or if you put a bunch of epi down your tube, epi's an acidic drug, okay? If you put a bunch of epi down your tube, you might not be able to detect anything. Severe airway obstruction, such as asthma, if you're not ventilating, if you're not getting that CO2 devoid air down to the alveoli for that gas exchange to occur, you may not get an appropriate waveform. And severe pulmonary edema, essentially, the gases can't diffuse across uh, that that fluid, all right? So in cardiac arrest, end tidal can correlate with your coronary perfusion pressures, all right? And thereby blood flow. So effective chest compressions, we should be seeing an end tidal between about 10 and 20 millimeters of mercury, right? End tidal CO2, over 20. It, we're going to talk a little bit about this, this is debatable as to what number you specifically look for, all right? But over 20, you should at least be considering that you might have ROSC or you're getting very close to getting ROSC if you have an entitle over 20, all right? If your entitle is consistency, consistently less than 10 millimeters of mercury, despite the fact you're doing excellent chest compressions, you've got a confirmed ET2 placement, this is an indicator of a very poor outcome. You're very unlikely to get ROSC in these patients. All right. So at end tidal first two or first pass, if this patient hadn't been getting chest compressions, you might start to see numbers around five. All right, no pulse, no compressions. And this is what I was referring to earlier, variance of studies and references I found just basically the about average mean of ROSC. Some papers have reported about 19, okay? Others report as high as 25 and some references suggested that we shouldn't really be considered until you've hit 30, okay? But somewhere around 20, you're doing well, you've got a good chance of ROSC, and then if you're above 20, starting to push 30, consider the fact that you've gotten ROSC, or if you see an abrupt rise in your CO2. 
Hey, Doc. Yeah. So uh, now that so many people are using Lucas devices or Autopulse, I think, uh, and Matt, like hear your opinion on this as well, we're, we're kind of normally seeing entile CO2 in the high 20s and even mid 30s on pretty much every cardiac arrest. So we certainly don't want to stop compressions right. to check a pulse just because it's 30. I think the relative entitled CO2 is probably the best metric there. If you see a jump, that's an indication. Yeah, that's all. So, sorry, that bar is a little bit low on there. Is that what you are seeing as well, Matt? Get that, Wes, I think I screwed up. Get that on that bar on top, but it shouldn't be a big issue. All right, so we'll talk about sedation real quick, go over your ketamine protocols, all right? So you essentially have multiple protocols. They all boil down to pain management. So whether it's abdominal pain, amputation, Biden of animation, burn, chest pain, right? So dosing of your ketamine. Take a look for review. There you go. All right, so sedation monitoring. The American College of Emergency Physicians have a, has a level B recommendation that essentially states capnography may be used as an adjunct to pulse ox in clinical assessment to detect hypoventilation and apnea earlier than pulse oximetry and or clinical assessment alone in patients undergoing procedural sedation and analgesia in the ED. A lot of words to say if you give a patient ketamine, put them on end title, please. Okay, the literature on this does vary. A lot of people have challenged us whether or not we truly detect earlier, whether it's just an adjunct, whether or not it may obscure and give you a false sense of security in your patient and you may not identify hypoxia. At the end of the day, it doesn't hurt, okay? Just costs a little bit of money for the equipment. Outside of that, there's not any harm to putting your patient on end title and using it as another adjunct for monitoring safety and watching out for hypoxia and hypoventilation, okay? Again, the idea here, detect hypoventilation earlier, especially if you've provided supplemental O2. So if you've had them on a non-rebreather for the last 10, 15 minutes, and you've got this complete nitrogen washout and their partial pressure of oxygen is through the roof down in their alveoli, that's the idea here, okay? Is that their lungs are just filled with 100% CO2 we're looking for you to detect the hypoventilation of that breathing adequately before that pulse ox starts to drop off, okay? So you can intervene upon that, okay? Also, it can help you monitor for upper airway obstruction, laryngospasm, bronchospasm. If you kind of see these changes in your graphs, right, may give you an early indication that you have some sort of upper airway obstruction that's occurring, whether or not you hear any striderous sounds or you recognize that they're starting to retract or struggle to get that air in. Okay. So, patient's gone apneic. Okay. Most flat lines in EMS are bad, right? Okay. Early evidence of hypoventilation, right? You've had a nice waveform graph, but now all of a sudden you're starting to get this steady, persistent elevation of the baseline and the steady increase in that end tidal, that's your early indication that the patient's got inadequate respirations. Here's some examples. I'm going to try to go to this link. If not, we'll just go over these smaller examples. All right, so we did that again. There it goes. Okay. So this is that website that I referenced initially. This is really cool, okay? All we gotta do is just hover over each situation and it'll show you what your end title should look like. So that's your normal capnogram, okay? So our asthma and our COPD ears, we have this kind of shark fin appearance of their end title. Why is that? Anybody have wanna? No or hazard guess. Okay, they have that prolonged exhalation period, right? They get that short, quick breath in and they blow out forever. So we get this prolonged kind of phase two into phase three appearance and then an immediate drop off when they start to inhale again. Okay, 
couple examples of an esophageal intubation. Flat line's bad. Okay. You might get some oscillations. Maybe you're doing chest compressions. Could just be some cardiac oscillations you have there. Okay. Versus we tubed right after they had drank that case of beer. And then it starts to fall off. That carbonated beverage, that end title starts to drop off. Okay. About the same. Just another example of cardiac oscillations that you may see. This is in a good tube. Okay. So, Dr. White, that yep. one, we get a lot of questions about that on the scene during cardiac arrest because we often see that with uh, chest compressions. That doesn't mean that you need to put more air in the tube. doesn't mean that the tube's bad. It's just air moving because of the chest compressions. All right. Okay, that's gonna. That's something. Well, another day, another time. Yes, you're correct. So, all right, you're given those chest compressions. There's going to be some air movement, right? Because you're causing compression, rise, compression, rise. Just kind of in a way, naturally, how we breathe. Okay, so hyperventilation. So again, some examples. All right, so in summary, this is a non-invasive measurement of partial pressure of CO2 during the respiratory cycles. It's displayed, it can be displayed as a waveform or as a number and or both, okay? It is gonna depict the respiratory cycle based on CO2 production, all right? It is a reliable kind of best method that you have of confirming your ET2 placement aside from having a video scope and actually watching that tube go through the cords, all right? Transport of an intubated patient should include cap waveform capnography. Again, monitoring that tube, monitoring during transition and transport. Okay, monitors compression during quality CPR may help you predict ROS depending on the numbers that you're seeing, and may help you early identify hypoventilation during sedation or administration of certain medications. Questions, comments, concerns? Two questions. The first one is uh, regarding uh, DKA. You know, we, if their blood sugar is high and then we're getting a high end title, you know, without labs or anything, would that would you even consider maybe giving some bicarb uh, with without any labs with, with just those two? So no, but from a different stance. So one, if they're DKA, they should be hyperventilating. They should be blowing all that CO2 off, right? Um, that question about bicarb is one of controversy and how and when it should be administered anyway. From our standpoint, we're not typically going to be doing bicarb unless their pH and this varies in the literature, whether it's less than 7.1, 7.0, 6.9, undetectable. Um, and then it's how you administer that bicarb. Bicarb pushes by and large in, in my reading, my understanding of the way I teach residents and my clinical practice, and Dr. Ferguson could comment if he disagrees. Bicarb pushes should really only be utilized in a TCA overdose with a widening of the QRS complex. Essentially, they have a sodium channel blockade and you have to give them sodium. Okay. You have increased intracranial pressure and you need a high sodium load and you don't have access to hot salts, that 3% saline, okay? Um, and then outside of that, there's not a lot of indication for a bicarb push. It doesn't work the way that it has been traditionally taught in CPR, cardiac arrest, and DK. Essentially, it's a massive sodium load that causes other electrolyte shifts that actually initially will make the patient more acidotic. And especially in a patient who is in one DKA, in theory, they've already maximized their respiratory drive in order to blow off as much of that CO2 as they possibly can. So if, you're, if we're even considering the way bicarb, we think it works, in which you have this dissociation, it goes to the brain, it creates CO2, goes to the brain, stimulates the respiratory center for the patient to breathe faster. When in theory, they're already breathing about as fast as they can. 
So you're not going to increase their respiration rate with that bicarb. All you're going to do is give them a massive sodium load that's going to mess with their hydrogen and potassium exchanges that's going to make them more acidotic. And then in, in cardiac arrest, who has control over the respiration rate? We do, right? So there's just really not an indication for bicarb. Um, and we're not going to be doing it without uh, uh, ABG, VBG in the ED. And if we do it, my personal practice is I'm going to mix three amps in sterile water if their sugar is over a thousand and drip it in, okay, at a rate. The second question, I guess, is more a systemic question. Uh, showing my age now, back 20 years ago, uh, SpO2 was the standard in EMS, and it took 10 to 15 years for the ERs to start getting it. Now, in title is our standard. When are the ERs going to start getting in title? When we roll in with a full arrest, they take our stuff off, and they don't even monitor in title. The person. <laughs> when CMS pays for it. <laughs> yeah, that's probably an inappropriate answer. No, I agree. So. Yeah. So even if the academic places in title is just now getting more relevant. So in a hospital setting, they monitor in title now for any sedation or PCA pumps because there's a risk of people not breathing their bad outcomes. So that's how that got pushed into it. Um, so it's going to take um, motivation or bad outcome or something to, to make more ERs utilize this. But I'm like you in the in the cardiac arrest where we work, I try to get catenography right, right there because it, it guides everything. Yeah. And like you said, the, the bicarb question, I agree. Most of the literature is going away from the pushes. Um, I mean, it still can be used pre-hospital. Uh, I will use it occasionally if I have a DKA or that's slowing down the respiratory rate and they got to be intubated. Sometimes I'll give them a, a little bit of a slug of bicarb as we intubate and then hyperventilate them again. But it's, it is fairly controversial yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can diagnose DK, DK in the field. It's pretty easy, right? The patients breathe them 40 times a minute. Their SATs are usually okay, but their end titles 10, and their glucose is high. That's DKA to prove otherwise. So, yeah, with Dr. Ferguson, as far as running a rest in the ED, I, I would prefer to have capnography and an A line on all my patients. Yeah, and capnography is the easy one to easy one to apply. So yeah. we get our A line and, and guide resuscitation. Okay, because uh, and, and just kind of piggybacking off of that, why is that? So we're notoriously bad at feeling for pulses, right? Feeling for that carotid, feeling for that radial, feeling for that femoral. So it's just a, a great adjunct that if you've got an end title, you know, 20 plus that you, you shouldn't be stopping, even if you, know, you do a pulse check and nobody can feel a pulse that something there, you just can't feel it. OK. Any other questions, comments? I want to take a break or move on to the next lecture. Good. Move on. Yeah. Got it. All right, let's see here. Les, how do I make this? Part? I'll just do it right there. You can see it now. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about heart failure. Um, as far vernacular goes, the congested portion of it's largely been been dropped. We just call it heart failure now, as we recognize the, the different etiology sources and uh, what we refer to as either the low output or high output. Okay. So essentially, this is just a very broad term that covers a multitude of diseases that culminate in a pathophysiological end result, right? We're referring to some impaired ventricular function or ejection fraction that can be due to structural and or a functional cardiac disorder that cannot meet the metabolic requirements of the tissues, right? Essentially, supply doesn't meet demand. But in some instances, demand can also outstrip supply. And that's kind of the basic way of referring to high output cardiac failure. You can have a normal to elevated ejection fraction, 60 to 70%, but still have inadequate tissue perfusion but that's going to be due to the tissue's demand 
for that perfusion that just cannot be met by the heart. So that's high output failure. It's going to be things like thyroid toxicosis right if they're in a thyroid storm, septic shock, which they're able to compensate for from a cardiac standpoint. Okay, again, the EF when I say that, but the tissues are still outstripping what their heart rate and their ejection fraction can do. Severe anemia, steroid use, excessive administration of fluid and bloods, blood products, sorry. And, and the AV fistula. Where do you guys most encounter AV fistulas? Dialysis patients. You show up on the scene and they busted that dialysis graft of their fistula and they're bleeding out everywhere. They can quickly go into this kind of metabolic state in which the end organ tissues, their demand for blood cannot be met by the heart. Manifestation of symptoms can be dyspnea, fatigue, Retention of fluid, but however, this is largely why this whole congestive or congestive heart failure term has been dropped, is they don't necessarily have to present with evidence of volume overload. When we say heart failure, we all typically think of this state of this impaired LV function, right? But it can result from pericardial, myocardial, endocardial, valvular, great vessels, or metabolic disorders, and can be further classified into whether or not they have a preserved ejection fraction or a reduced ejection fraction. I'm sure by now you're familiar with the term hef, 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 ref? Maybe, maybe not. There you go. <laughs> so some pearls. This is what, when you hear the term hef, hef, or hef, ref, all right, that's going to be preserved ejection fraction versus reduced ejection fraction. And what we mean by that is preserved, they have an ejection fraction of over 50% or less than 40%. The preserved ejection fraction typically means they have some sort of diastolic dysfunction. There's abnormal filling of the heart, okay? In diastole, the relaxation portion, that ventricle is inadequately filling, but it's not necessarily synonymous. There are other etiologies, other reasons that this can occur, but most commonly it's the diastolic failure, okay? So heart failure with reduced EF, this is the impaired ejection, all right? Most commonly this systolic dysfunction where we get this cardiomyopathy, this big dilated chamber, all right? Which you can see on chest x-ray, see on echo, all right? and the remodeling that can occur. There's nothing to say that systolic and diastolic dysfunction cannot coexist with, with each other. Okay. That, uh, oh, just that principle escaped me that um, patient, uh, the patient can have as many diseases as that dang well please. Yeah, it's, um, they teach you in med school that everybody has one complaint, one problem. Yeah. Work up. In reality, no. Right. That's not the case. <clears throat> Hickam's dictum. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> Okay. The symptoms can vary. They can be on a continuum, right? That heart failure patient, is there a difference between somebody who's warm and dry versus cold and dry? Warm and wet versus cold and wet, right? That warm and dry patient is probably earlier on in their symptom onset. That patient with distal, poor distal perfusion, cold extremities, volume overload, cold and wet patients, those are super sick patients, critical patients, okay? Treatment can depend on the underlying cause or trigger, all right? Not every patient is always going to be volume overloaded, but something to remember to ask the patient is, do you check your weight every day? Does your doctor ask you to check your weight every day? If you've been doing it, what's your weight been doing, okay? We going up, we going down. So diagnosis. You've got to take a careful history and perform a physical exam, an appropriate physical exam, all right? There's no true diagnostic test that says this is or is, this is not heart failure. We have a lot of adjuncts that we use to support our diagnosis, but at the end of the day, this is a clinical diagnosis. This is a physical exam, a good history with a story that fits, okay? Ask the patient about triggers. What have you been doing over the last couple of days, last couple of weeks? 
Okay, you've been adding some salt to your diet, right? Do you have your medicines? Have you been taking your medicines? Okay, participating in some extracurricular activities, All right? Have you had any infectious symptoms? All right. Arrhythmias, maybe they've had some palpitations, some intermittent chest pain. Their doctor's been messing with their medications, trying to get their blood pressure under better control. They've been compliant with their meds, but they've just had poor BP control. Okay, substance abuse, typically are sympathomimetics, right, or cocaine, methamphetamines. Dietary indiscretions and non-compliance. All right, so what are some things that you might want to look for? I got an hour and a half left. I can sit here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you What are y'all gonna look for? You show up on the scene. With Dr. Ferguson already covered a case very similar to this, right? So what are you looking for? You show up on the scene. Patient's complaining of shortness of breath. That's your chief complaint. You walk in. What do I see here? Smell. All right. What are you seeing? What are you looking for? Body position. Okay. Body position. What does the patient look like? Are they attended? All right, so are they tachycardic, are they tachypnic, or is there evidence of increased work of breathing? All right, they've got retractions, they can't speak in full sentences. Do a pulmonary exam, they've got rails, might be consistent with pulmonary edema. All right, could also be pneumonia, multifocal pneumonia. What is this? JVD. All right, just might be something you notice. Honest answer is I don't typically check it in the emergency department. Okay, cardiologists tell you, hey, they have JVD, how many centimeters? And it's heart failure, I don't know. Looks like heart failure, smells like heart failure, it's heart failure. But if you're gonna do it, okay, patient sit at about a 45 degree angle, looking at that sternal notch, and they shouldn't have any more dilation than about three centimeters above that sternal notch. Anything above three centimeters, positive JVD. What's this? Pitting edema. Okay. What happens if their arms and their belly are doing that? Y'all know the term we use for that? I yeah, heard it. Okay. Anasarca. All right. Just, just diffuse body wall edema. All right. You get these patients, they, you can even pit their eyelids. Don't poke the eyes. <laughs> Usually, if it's made it to their abdomen, you can stop pretty high. All right. But again, this may not always be present. Okay. Maybe they might just be complaining of upper of belly pain, right? For quadrant abdominal pain. They've got all this hepatic congestion. The liver's big and distended. So some things that we're going to do in the emergency department. Um, and I've, I've noticed more and more crews are hanging around. I love it. They drop their patients off. They give us their story. And we're getting all of our equipment in and, and I turn around and they're still standing in the room looking, hey doc, what's going on? What are y'all doing? Uh, I love it. You guys are asking a lot of great questions. So I'm hoping some of y'all seen some ultrasound. You know, we go quickly grab that ultrasound and I would not surprise me in the next five years, if not sooner, you're gonna have ultrasound in the field, okay? And you might be looking for some of these things on your own, okay? Does anybody know what this is? These are what we call B lines, pulmonary B lines. This would be indicative of a patient that has pulmonary edema, abnormal fluid in their lungs. How about this? Not just reading that. Like we know it's an IVC. What about that IVC? So it's big and distended. Okay. So what we often do is we put that probe right here and we ask the patient to sniff. <laughs> We're looking to see what this vessel does. Okay, this vessel collapses down, and these two walls, top wall and bottom wall, touch each other. Okay, they've got good collapsibility. It's unlikely that they're volume overloaded. Doesn't necessarily mean it's not a heart failure exacerbation, it's just not a volume overloaded heart failure exacerbation at the moment. Okay, but if they, you know, if you get this measurement and this thing, and we can actually freeze frame it, right, and measure the distance, if this thing's like six centimeters, okay. Significant volume overload, distended IVC. Here, might look for some things that are effusions, okay, pericardial effusions, pleural effusions, right? So this is abnormal 
this fluid in, or around the heart within the pericardial sac shouldn't be that much. You should have some physiological effusion, pericardial fluid, not to that degree. Okay, we're also going to be estimating that ejection fraction. We're going to look at that left ventricle and that right ventricle and try to estimate how well they're contracting. So some other things that we may do, okay, again, labs are only suggestive of, not confirmatory. We get what's called a BNP, brain natriuretic peptide. It's going to typically be elevated, okay, but just know it can certainly be low, falsely low in obese patients. So somewhere we tend to say less than 100 on that lab. Uh, it's unlikely to be a heart failure exacerbation. I wouldn't say that it can't be, but it's very unlikely to be. If the number's over 500, and depending on who, which literature you look at or read, some say 1,000, we tend to use 500. If it's over 500, then the likelihood that it is a heart failure exacerbation is, is much higher. Other abnormalities. Maybe they're having an end stemming that's kind of set all this off. Maybe they had their infarct a couple days ago. They didn't realize it. They just had a little epigastric pain. What they thought was reflux, they popped their tums and kept on going. And then two, three, four days later, now they can't breathe. Okay. Creatinine, renal dysfunction. We've already talked a little bit about the LFTs and why and that hepatic congestion. So their liver function tests, their liver enzymes can be significantly elevated. Chest x-ray, what's going on here? Normal, abnormal. Abnormal, right. Air shows up is what on x-ray? Black. There's something in there more than air. That's just horrible pulmonary edema. Could be COVID. Could be. It's all COVID. All right, let's talk a little bit about treatment. Okay, the patients are going to be sitting themselves upright if they can. If they're not and they can tolerate it, protecting their airway and you don't need to be managing an airway, sit them up. Okay, get your blood pressure. Start thinking through, do they need some preload reduction, some afterload reduction, All right? How are we going to do that? Thought I had one more, <laughs> one more, uh, little bullet up there before that popped up. All right, so nitro. Okay, so nitrates, right? We can give them sublingual, we can give them IV, we can give them transdermal. What are some things that you want to ask about it, confirm before you go give in nitro? Okay, that's one. What else? Dr. Ferguson touched on this a little bit. Okay, any other? Yeah, blue pill stuff, right? So. The phosphodiesterase inhibitors, that's your Viagra, Sildenafil, right, erectile dysfunction medications. Or some of these patients may be on them already if they have horrible pulmonary hypertension. Their pulmonologist may already have them on them. So don't forget that, that there are other indications for these drugs besides ED. I can't remember which one for, uh, instead of Flomax. Um, for urinary retention, you're supposed to take it every day. Severe aortic stenosis, and we touched on this again earlier in EKG review. Review. They're having that right-sided MI, right? Really, really, really careful. They're having that right-sided MI. These patients are very preload dependent and inferior MIs. So your protocol say you can give 0.4 milligram sublingual. If the SVP is greater than 110, you can repeat it five minutes in intervals times two for a total of three doses, okay? If given in rapid sequence, rapid succession, or they're on high dose IV, then we start to get generalized vasodilation, not just venous venodilation, all right? This is where we start to look at that afterload reduction in addition to the preload reduction. Some things that we might consider, you guys are not going to be doing this, but ACE inhibitors, these are also controversial, probably not going to be doing that in the ED without consultation of a cardiologist. Okay. 
So if their physical exam is consistent with volume overload, they've got that anasarca pitting edema, you've listened to their lungs, they've got rails throughout, they're hypoxic. What else can we do? Urosamine. He must get paid. Pharma sponsored. Um, all right, so diuretic or retics, there is a dosing debate, all right? Most literature would agree that at least a one-to-one -one IV to home dose is what is recommended. So if the pa patient takes 80 milligrams a day, probably going to take 80 milligrams. Okay. We tend to do one and a half to two times the dose. Whether that's correct or not, again, this is this is very debatable. Okay. Uh, but your protocols essentially allow for 40 milligrams IV. The diuretic choice is also debatable, whether it's furosemide, torsemide, budesonide, right? In the emergency department, if we've given 100, 120, like if they've gotten this massive slug of Lasix and they're not peeing, probably not going to do them any good to continue to give them larger and larger doses of Lasix. We might start considering things like the thiazide diuretics, just another class of diuretics in addition. So these are what are known as loop diuretics where they work within the nephrons within the kidney okay probably time to switch classes start looking at a thiazide diuretic or something like a spironolactone additional treatments oxygen as needed okay kind of talked about this short transport times you're not going to hurt them all right from our standpoint if they don't need it, we're not going to give it. They're 92%. They're hanging out and doing okay. And now subjectively, if it makes them feel better, if they want that nasal cannula on their nose and you put them on two or three liters and they're now 96, 98%, but that has reduced their work of breathing, that has reduced their anxiety, then it's every bit worth it to do it. Okay. Positive pressure. All right. So CPAP, your protocol say over the age of 12, awake, oriented, and able to protect their airway. Protocols say BiPAP as well. I don't know what the, the difference between CPAP and BiPAP is aside from the acronym. <laughs> Pete, okay. So CPAP provides what and BiPAP provides what, do you know? Well, they both have, right? So it's bi-level. You actually can make, can create a difference between your inspiratory and your expiratory pressures with BiPAP. Okay, so that's that. I set them at five over ten. I set them at five over twelve. What have you? That's BiPAP. CPAP, just one pressure, in and out. When it's just oxygenation alone, CPAP is sufficient. Okay, BiPAP is more for the CO2 retainers. Okay. You're not wrong for choosing BiPAP over CPAP. Don't expect you to know, right? We can get a gas in the ED, but kind of the basic difference that why we want to put our COPDers, our emphysema patients on BiPAP over CPAP is we want to help them eliminate that CO2, okay? Can start at five centimeters of water and titrate up to 15. So this works in a multitude of ways. Another is it increases this intrathoracic pressure and helps you reduce that preload, kind of helps your nitrates work, right? So we get this increase in intrathoracic pressure, the lungs further expanded, kind of compresses on that IVC and slows that blood flow return from the lower extremities, okay? So we have a slower venous return back to the heart, so we're reducing that preload, right? So that we're reducing the amount of blood coming back to the right side of the heart. It's the same thing your nitrates are doing. When you give your nitrates, you get a bunch of peripheral venodilation. All that blood hangs out down there. Okay. Helps reduce the work of breathing and reduces the uh, sympathetic drive. And we'll talk a little bit more about the sympathetic drive when we discuss SCAPE. So decompensated heart failure, these are more kind of advanced therapies, again, not something that we're typically going to do with outside of cardiology consultation, all right? 
digoxin uh, can be controversial. Um, it is ionotrope. It kind of helps the heart squeeze. It's probably a pretty good medicine on our chronic AFibers with heart failure. Um, there's actually not any data that supports better outcomes uh, as far as mortality, morbidity, mortality, but patients seem to feel better. Okay. Amiodarone is another one to consider if you have to, if you're kind of at the end of your rope. All right, we want to avoid antidysrhythmics. We want to avoid calcium channel blockers that can worsen the heart failure. We want to avoid NSAIDs, ibuprofen, Aleve, Motrin, Mobix, Celebrex, all of those, right? They're going to increase your sodium retention, and if these patients are on their ACE inhibitors and other diuretics, they can get toxic on these medicines. There is some data that morphine may have an increase in morbidity in acute decompensated heart failure patients. Causation versus correlation, kind of hard to say, right? Let's talk about scape. The sympathetic crashing acute pulmonary edema. Essentially, this is just a massive sympathetic overdrive of patients, all right? It's a horrible, vicious cycle that they get into that we have to help them break, All right? So this is going to be different than acute CHF or hypotensive cardiogenic shock. These patients are going to have evidence of volume overload, rails and crackles with that pulmonary edema. They're going to have a systolic pressure that should be over 180, and they're going to be tachycardic, All right? More often than not, these patients are actually volume down so diuretics are not always indicated. And I, I misspoke earlier when I mentioned that. So the, in general, whole body volume down. These patients are in general whole body volume down and are not going to respond as well to diuretics. These patients tend to have a history of poorly controlled hypertension, right? They get this acute increase in afterload, so their left ventricle is pumping hard against that peripheral arterial afterload, backs up into the lungs, and they get pulmonary edema, all right? They kind of get into this cycle of this sympathetic surge due to this poor systemic perfusion. The kidneys kind of start freaking out that they're not getting enough blood, and they start saying, hey, hey, I need more blood, but the kidney's response to get more blood is to actually vasoconstrict and clamp down. So then their peripheral pressures go up, further increasing that afterload that ultimately results in this rapid decompensation. So again, they get in this vicious cycle. So they get this afterload, BP goes up, they can't perfuse their organs, can't perfuse the kidney. Okay, they start to get pulmonary edema. The peripheral organs, specifically the kidneys, start to freak out, send messages to the brain, hey, we need more blood. The brain's response to that is to further increase blood pressure. So that's how we get in this vicious cycle, which they just ultimately decompensate. I think about something. Um, about a year or so ago, we had a patient that uh, had an overdose, and they just slammed him with tons of Narcan. And he ended up having some non cardiac pulmonary edema having to be intubated because of the stupid knock too quickly. Is yeah. that something similar like this? It's a little bit different of a, of a pathophysiological process, and, and there's debate in the literature as to why that's happening with Narcan. Um, I would just in general say that if you've given a, a reasonable dose of Narcan without response, banish the patient, quit giving Narcan. Yeah. Two milligrams, no no response. Just manage the patient, manage the symptoms, protect their airway. Okay, don't, don't come in saying, "Oh, we gave him you know eight milligrams of Narcan before we finally got a response." Okay. All right. So in these patients, we have to manage the afterload, the preload, and the pulmonary edema. And we've talked about these kind of back to all the treatments. How we're going to do that? Okay, our nitrates our BiPAP, and then in a, other additional medications if we need them for afterload, nitroprusides and, and others, okay? Early and aggressive intervention will reduce morbidity, mortality, and actually may stave off intubation, all right? Essentially, these are going to be the heart of, of what we're doing, nitrates and positive pressure. 
So cardiogenic shock, we mentioned this or touched on this a little bit earlier when we first got into this about the patient that's warm and dry versus the sick patient that's cold and wet, right? Features are going to be inadequate organ perfusion, tachycardia, hypotension, cold, clammy, maybe altered. Right? They're going to need ventilatory support, positive pressure ventilation of some version, okay? appropriate based on their mental status and airway protection. We need to try to keep their MAPS above 65. This might be a time when even though you're, you're concerned that they're volume overloaded already, if this is the first and fastest thing that we can get going, just a, a little fluid challenge to try to get their pressures up, right? We're going to be looking at vasopressors. This is going to be much harder for you guys to do in the field, right? We're going to be considering norepi, dobutamine, milrinone, epinephrine. Your protocols say consider dopamine at 5 to 20 mics per kilo per minute. Dopamine has pretty much fallen out of favor of complete use, okay? Again, this is what we're looking at using, okay? I would say most people are going to be more comfortable with norepi or dobutamine, right? You do now have the option of epi, 1 to 100,000 push dose. Be very, very, very careful doing this, okay? This is wrought for medication errors over administration and patient harm. All right. Personally, I would prefer epi over dopamine, but you know, risk benefit analysis in the field on that one. Okay. Dose is 0 0.5 to 2 ml, 5 to 20 mics every two to five minutes per your protocols. So some of the resources used to put together this lecture. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Hey, I actually have a question about the LASIK thing because that's always something I'm kind of hard to not figuring out if my patient needs that or not. What's going to be a determining factor for y'all when we need to give LASIK to a patient that's like having properly issues or fluid or whatever? You're not really going to hurt them doing that. Okay. Just if you think it's indicated if they've got peripheral edema, if they've got rails and they take it at home and they make urine, we're going to try it in the ED from time to time too and see if there's a response. If there's a response and they improve, great. If not, move on to the next therapy. I think the only problem is this category B, which we hope to change next year, the next meeting. Um, and then the other problem is be them peeing on your stretcher. But but that's not a bad problem so. <laughs> for me, anyway. Any yeah, other questions? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we did have uh, one question come in online. Uh, question was about fluid overload type uh, presentation from cocaine or other symptomatics. Treatment the same. Anything that you would add or change, and would you consider benzos? Yeah, so if they're still actively sympathomimetic, and that is they're tachycardic, altered, blood pressure still through the roof, I just did a couple lines of cocaine, benzos, okay? You want to calm that sympathetic overdrive down with benzos. But if it's that I was on a cocaine bender for the last three to four days, and in the last couple of hours of doing it, I had some chest pain, and then I woke up this morning, and now I've got you know pulmonary edema and anasarca, et cetera, I don't know that you necessarily need to give them benzos. So that's that clinical presentation. If they look sympathomimetic with recent cocaine use, yes, stop that sympath uh, stop that cycle with the benzos. But if it's, hey, I you know just had a, a good weekend out in Vegas and now I'm back and I had my heart attack while I was you know, unconscious from from doing a big <laughs> big line of cocaine, I don't, they don't necessarily need benzo. So that's more of a clinical diagnosis. And when you, that's cat B, so when you call in, just be quick and efficient. Hey, doc, I got this, you know, male hypertensive tachycardic, been doing some coke. I'm going to give him some benzos. We'll see you in a few minutes. So yeah. tell the doc what you want. They should give you what you want. If not, reach out to me. Cool. And the ketamine that you talked about, the capnography, if you don't have capnography, then you can use your SAT monitor. But I know I've said it a billion times. If you give ketamine or any sedative drug and the patient gets hypoxic, they don't get just oxygen they get airway management and then oxygen with ventilation if they need it. So 
The only big risk to ketamine is people quit breathing, uh, which you can manage as long as you assess the patient and, and realize it. If you don't realize it and you just put them on O2 and now they get passive oxygenation for 10 minutes, breathing two times a minute, they end up dying and that's poor form. So. Very good. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ferguson, Dr. White. Great lectures today. Um, once again, please remember to submit an attendance form for everybody that participated today, even if you don't think you need the Con Ed. Um, and oh, we got one more question real quick. One, um, somebody in the field wants to know from the two physicians how they feel about doing an epinephrine drips in the pre-hospital setting. Again, a little controversial. Um, give some context. Just in general, epinephrine drips, or is this? In, are, are we just talking about the heart failures? <laughs> I, I would, I would assume that they mean epinephrine drips when indicated by cardiogenic shock. So I think epi drips, if they're hypotensive, bradycardic septic if you need epi for that reason that's reasonable just you got to be careful with the epi drips that you don't mix the epi hang the epi and then you look up and five minutes later oh crap 250 cc's of epi just went into somebody it's just like the push dose epi the one to 100,000 is relatively safe as long as you know what you're doing you give it appropriately but i can tell you i've seen one to ten thousand given uh instead of one to one hundred thousand then you take your patient from being hypotensive and bradycardic and be tac it's kind of fun to manage, but it's for management. So, um, I'll touch just a little bit on just from a heart failure standpoint. Um, low dose epi, a lot of good beta agonism with your lower dose epi. And what when we say that, you're going to get more of an inotropic effect. You're going to get more of a squeeze out of the heart. So the idea there is increasing the inject the ejection fraction. As you increase your dose of epi, and unless you're carrying a pump and, and really controlling the rate by which this is being administered, if you start to cross over into more of the alpha effects, what you're doing there is you're now increasing afterload. So you, you're kind of starting to fight against yourself and what you're trying to do in the first place. Okay. So that was the hesitation and, and you know, saying that, yeah, go ahead and use that is it is a titratable medication that you need to titrate very carefully, very closely, and and ideally have invasive advanced monitoring like A lines and be able to you know do bedside echoes and and reassessments with with probably more than what you guys have in the back of the truck. But if at the end of the day, you know that's what you have, then you know, call online medical direction and, and talk it through, okay? Perfect. Thanks, docs.